I have my own opinions on Hyper-V versus vSphere versus Proxmark. And there's a difference, I think, between deploying in an enterprise and there's a difference between a lab, but there's also a lab trying to mimic an enterprise versus a lab teaching you things that you otherwise wouldn't be able to do. So I'm curious, like Florentine, you sent me an email and you have specific questions, but like, uh, Marcus, do you have an opinion on this one? Like, do you have a preference? I have, but it, it's not really based on trying all the alternatives because I have experience from Proxmox and some from okay. VMware, but I like Proxmox, but I haven't really tried the other ones. Oh, okay, as, all right, all right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, that's fair. So I, I've deployed all three. Uh, I can't say I've done Proxmox in an enterprise environment. I've only ever done that in a lab. Um, but it's kind of funny because I would say of the three, my favorite to have in a lab is Proxmox. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the debate for me, and it doesn't really have to be a debate, it's just sharing facts and sometimes counterpoints I think are helpful because in my mind, the way I view these is which is most likely to be an enterprise. And from what I see, it's vSphere, Hyper-V, Proxmox. Which one gets you the most capabilities in a lab? It's probably Proxmox, Hyper-V, vSphere, and it's actually the exact opposite. Um, but to me, that's because Proxmox is free, yet it has all the enterprise features we would have in vSphere with vCenter, with vSAN. It's really cool. So then the question is, for a home lab, I mean, the, the goal for a home lab is to learn these technologies, the hypervisors themselves, is it to learn the specific is tool or is it to learn the capabilities because vMotion versus live migration versus whatever you want to call it in Acropolis and all the other hypervisors, does it really matter as long as you know what it's doing? What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> Go ahead, I'll, feel free to chime in. Florentine, Marcus, or is it just you just wanna have, uh, for you right now, is it just, um, like right now, like Florentine, you sent me a huge email, uh, basically about Proxmox and its capabilities because you're kind of swinging back and forth between which hypervisor to use, but your thought process, you kind of hit me with almost like business requirements. Right, you're like I want to do a, a hypervisor in a lab, but I needed to do these things, yeah. which is extremely appropriate because that's what you would do in real life. But you also were like, "But I, I don't know about that Proxmox thing because I don't know if it'll do promiscuous mode. I don't know if it'll like." Yes, uh, my main concern is if Proxmon um, support. Um, promiscuous mode of v, v switching uh, VMware. Yep. Uh, yes. It, and so for me, like I, I've deployed all three, and I technically would say all three meet your requirements. Like what you put in your email, and I'll go through them because I don't have them memorized, but like you can do promiscuous mode on each of them. They're all technically type one hypervisors. Like they're purpose built lightweight for deploying virtualization right off the bare metal uh, versus like VMware Workstation, VirtualBox, Fusion, which you would install your OS and then put a type two hypervisor on top. And for a lab, for this discussion, I like the type ones. Well, I can't walk up to them and log into Windows and use it for meetings like we are now. It's literally intentional dedicated hardware for virtualization, right? which means things can be running all the time. Now, if I'm comparing the three, my least favorite personally, just throwing this out there, and I don't, I don't think it's a horrible solution, I just, my, I personally don't care for it, is Hyper-V. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a big fan of Hyper-V, but it's the one that's the most likely to work. And the reason I say that is if you can get Windows installed on something, Hyper-V will work. So there's much, much larger, I feel, uh, driver support. Like you might have one gig, 10 gig, 
Firebird channel. You can have all sorts of crazy hardware. It's probably going to work with Windows. That's not true of vSphere. I actually say vSphere is probably one that's the least likely to work of the three because of hardware compatibility. Um, even the Z620s I use in my lab, when I installed during the video I did last week, it, it now throws up. This is not going to be compatible in future releases. It's like, oh, whatever, it's compatible now, move on. <laughs> but then Proxmox is basically Linux. I would say there's more dr device driver support on Linux than there would be with vSphere. So each of them has strengths and weaknesses. Uh, Windows, you technically have to have a Windows license, but you can get those fairly cheap online. Some of them from questionable sources. You get trial licenses. The thing I, I'm, if I were to debate, and you're all more than welcome to debate with me because this isn't about proving which one's right. It's just about talking strengths and weaknesses here. I think in a lab, personally, I think Proxmox makes the most sense. It gets you effectively every bell and whistle, but it's quite a bit harder to get it set up. And it seems counterintuitive to a home lab, but here's my thinking. If I were to hire someone and they had Proxmox working in a lab with you know, live migration, uh, maybe the hyper-converged storage with Ceph, which you do need three servers for that one, you don't have to do that. I'm just saying, if you did that, and someone I was interviewing, they're like, hey, have you ever done vSphere? No, have you ever done Hyper-V? No. Well, then what good are you? I wouldn't say that, by the way. But, but they're like, well, I've done Proxmox and I've set this up. And I was like, oh, wow. Because getting even like VLANs set up in Proxmox, it's not hard, but it's definitely not easy. Like it's a, a more of an intermediate area. And so you have to force learn. Like Florentine, you want to do promiscuous mode. The answer is yes, yes you can. But in vSphere, I have to go in and I just have to say like VLAN 4095 on a port group. And now I can listen on everything that the host sees. You're done. With Proxmox, you have to go in and edit syscontrol and you have to do some network adapter changes. And it's, there's a few steps you'll have to do, but then it does work. And so by forcing yourself to figure out those nuanced changes, I, I'm going to argue that that for a home lab helps you. The other thing I like though, is you get to do every enterprise feature always and forever. Like I used to do vSphere on an essentials kit. It would cost me $500 a year. It's great. Cause now I'm literally set up the exact same way a corporate environment would be. Like I had my hypervisors, I had vCenter, I had iSCSI uh, on like a cheap appliance that I put together, you know, just kind of custom built and put like open file or open F NFS. There's a bunch of free ways you can make your own SAM. And I learned a ton doing it, but I had to buy that license every year. <laughs> so it's $500 and I do a $500 Microsoft license to get access to all of them for labs. And so now you're at a thousand dollars a year and that stuff adds up. And so with Proxmox, being able to do all those feature sets and not having to pay for it, that's kind of cool. So I don't know, but if I'm, if, if I'm debating against myself, because you're all being quiet, <laughs> <laughs> Proxmox is not something I'm likely to see in an enterprise environment. What I almost always see, like, First of all, it'd be like AWS, Azure, Google. Like I see a lot of those, which are their hypervisors. Then it's vSphere. And a smidge of Hyper-V. And I've never ran into a business using Proxmox. I'm not saying they don't exist. I've just, in any of the, the SANS classes I've trained or any of the clients that I do consulting with, you know, and I have a lot of them every year, never encountered Proxmox in an enterprise environment. So does it make sense to learn something that you're not going to see in the wild? And I'm going to argue yes, by the way. <laughs> but there is the, like some employers, unfortunately, if you come in and you're like, I stood up vSphere in a lab, you've gained a whole bunch of points. If you were to go in and say, I deployed Proxmox in a lab, what probably is going to happen is it's going to go whoop. And they're like, what's, what's that? 
And in which case, if you're trying to get a job, did that really help you? But my argument now here for this is it's your fault because you didn't describe your experience correctly. Because if I go in saying I know Proxmox and they look at you with that deer in the headlight, like I don't know what you're talking about and be like, oh yeah, we're, I've done virtual machine migrations. I can deploy containers. I can do you know, shared storage. I can do, um, like if you start going through all the hyper-converged, like I have local disks on more than one server, but they're kind of like a virtual raid, kind of like V, like it's like vSAN, but it's within Proxmox because Proxmox is free. They'll probably be like, uh, I don't really know what Proxmox is, but the rest of that, I clearly know what that is. And if you have experience in that, that's what they're looking for. Uh, and the reason I'm bringing that out is I had a call last week, I believe, uh, with John Hubbard, where we were just doing a live talk kind of like this. And someone had four SANS GX certs, but they didn't have a job. And the question was, why is nobody hiring me? And one of the points I was trying to argue is maybe it's not the bullet points on your resume, but it's how you're speaking them. So again, Proxmox... Uh, I feel there's a lot of folks that don't even know what that is, but if you were to start, if you instead of putting that or underneath that said, you know, virtual environment can migrate virtual machines from host to host, and you start listing some of those, it might, it might translate a little better. Now, ultimately for like Florentine, like for you, I would actually prefer you do a little bit of each, but then stick to one. Like, because I just put together, I think it was a 45 minute uh, video on installing vSphere and vCenter, which 60 day trial, I wouldn't leave it in a 60 day trial because after 60 days, you lose all your capabilities. But if you spent one day and it would, it's not going to take you 45 minutes, it would take two to four hours if we're being honest, right? Because my video, I even sped things up, like it says 15 times speed increase. So I cheated, right? <laughs> it didn't take me 45 minutes either. Uh, but if it took you two to four hours, you did it, and then you just immediately destroyed it afterwards. Isn't that what we used to do as kids with Legos? And we got better at it, and we learned cooler ways of doing things, unless you're like me, and I'm still artistically challenged. So it didn't really work out that well at any time. <laughs> but... If you could stand up vSphere and vCenter within four hours, which I think is doable, that could be one evening, because you you guys are joining here after hours anyway, that could be one evening, four nights, whether they're in a row or a not, right? And if you were to do Hyper-V, which is probably what my next video will be, it's gonna be the same thing. You get Windows stood up and then very quickly after that, you're deploying Hyper-V virtual machines. Uh, the difference with that is maybe you could use SMB shares for your shared storage instead of NFS and iSCSI, which we do with other things. Uh, but if you deployed that once, there's four hours, you deploy Hyper-V once, that's four hours, that's eight hours, one full day. And then you blew both of them away and you settled it on Proxmox. That's actually why I'm doing the videos the way I'm doing, by the way. I'm doing Hyper-V because it's the most realistic in enterprise, followed by, I'm sorry, vSphere, followed by Hyper-V. But ultimately, the last video I'm going to release is Proxmox because my lab environment's going to stay Proxmox um, just because it's the most feature sets. Now, for you guys, are you, are you deploying hypervisors on one box or more than one out of curiosity? What are you doing? I just have one box. One box? Yeah. What about you, Marcus? At home, it's one, but at work, we have like clusters of three with three. self storage. But oh, even better. Okay. So you're, you're able to do the hyper converge. So, one thing you can also do this is more for Florentine since you have one box. You technically could take one box and deploy your hypervisors on top of it as virtual machines. Like on my, I have three HP Z620s, 96 gig of RAM. Uh, they're dual eight core boxes, so 16 cores a piece. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna deploy eventually 
vSphere and Hyper-V on top of Proxmox. And I'll leave them running or at least have them in a powered off state if I don't want them up all the time. It's nested virtualization, which is not a good idea. You wouldn't want to do it in production because it's super slow, but it would let you dabble in all the hypervisors in a way that you can power them on and off and play with them as you see fit. It's just, if I have Hyper-V and vSphere on top of Proxmox or the all other way around, those nested hypervisors will be quite a bit slower. If you don't have virtual hardware extensions on your, your CPU and the BIOS, it'll be like 10 to 15 times slower processing. But if it's only for learning, who cares? <laughs> so don't take that as me saying you should have all three. I, because I, I have to support businesses that use each, uh, I'm probably gonna do that so that I can test like you know, how do their logs look like in a SIM and how do you upgrade from version six to seven? And so I, I have to be a little bit more dabbling, but for you all, I, I would recommend consolidating to one platform. It looks like Marcus, you're already doing Proxmox. Florentine, what, what's your goal? Is your goal, yeah. are you trying to learn this for hobby, for fun? Is this like yeah. a career move for you? No, it's just for uh, for fun, for for hobby, to to build a network, uh, to build a defendable network, uh, yeah. and um, learn the things. I um, I wonder how how we can um, yeah um, to build a theme, how to monitor the clients and uh, collect the data and. Yeah, maybe just trying to to attack that network to to see how an attack evolves and um, just things for for fun. This is my my hobby. I'm working in IT, but not in security. Yeah. So so you're one of those crazy folks that actually enjoys this. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I'm not I'm not doing for for the for the cash. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, that's that, that's that's cool. Um. I still would almost say try, I would, I would push you more towards Proxmox or vSphere uh, unless your hardware doesn't work, in which case Hyper-V is gonna be fine. Yeah. And technically for, for anybody watching this after the fact, a hypervisor makes a lot of sense for a dedicated lab, but you don't need a dedicated lab. You can do VirtualBox for free on top of your Linux, Mac, Windows box and that's fine. Um, I like having a dedicated lab because also then at this point, like one of the things Florentine, I could see you totally doing this just, just from the little bit and the way you word your emails, like making a virtual machine that when you're not home, you can connect over the internet into your lab and access things and yeah. 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 And it, if it's always there and always running, that works really well. If it's on your laptop, you're carrying with you, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Okay. Well, let me, I'm going to bring up your email. Uh, so I'm just going to go down some of the questions you had. Uh, first off, can Proxmox be ran as a type two hypervisor? It is technically a type one because it runs directly on the hardware. Yeah. But you could technically run it inside of like VirtualBox or VMware Workstation. It's still a type one now on virtual hardware though. So it's, it's intended to be a dedicated hypervisor. So it would fall under type one, which is arguably faster, more secure and whatever. There's nothing wrong with type two. It's just type two is you have a laptop, a desktop, it's your OS, and then you install virtualization on top of it. Yeah. Um, do I recommend type two for Tyrell Corporation if you're trying to mimic like a, a design we did for uh, Sec 530? Um, to be honest, the port mirroring for like Security Onion or Zeek or Suricata, you can do that on type two or type one. So I could have VirtualBox or Fusion and Workstation on top of my Windows box right now. And I could have Security Onion listening and capturing traffic for everything, yeah. only VMs or everything, including my host. And with the type one hypervisors, you can do the same thing. 
So they're all going to work for everybody. It's just picking out whether it's a dedicated virtual platform type one sitting over in the corner or you can't afford the additional hardware. So it's on top of your box of type two. Both are going to be fine for that. If you do Proxmox, it's a little challenging to get that set up, but you can do it. Um, which hypervisor do I think fits a zero trust strategy? Oh. Well, first off, zero trust is, a, it is a strategy, right? It's log, verification, uh, authenticating who can access it. So which of these do I think can mimic that the best? It's the type one hypervisors. Because you can integrate them with Active Directory and LDAP schema like uh, Proxmox. You could do like the various Linux PAM authentication model modules. Um, so it's a little bit easier to log and inspect something that drops logs and integrates with other systems. Workstation, VirtualBox and Player. Technically it's a lab, it's just you against you. So there's not a whole lot to monitor anyway. <laughs> I think you'd be fine either way. It's just whether yeah. your budget allows you to have a dedicated box. I do think type one hypervisors are much more enterprise though, because of the additional integrations like Active Directory authentication to access the platform. Um, you also, because vSphere and for sure Proxmox, they have web interfaces that have almost all capabilities. So you could access them when you're not home over the internet and have multi-factor, you can integrate it with things like Cloudflare and there's a whole bunch of cool things you can do because again, it's kind of more of that enterprise feel to it. Or you could just use something like TeamViewer and remote in and go that way too, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever works, right? Um, your plan, you wanna build a SIM that will mimic a network such as Tyrell Corporation, which for those of you watching this, that's just a mock entity based on the movie Blade Runner. Uh, you want to collect data from on-prem as well as cloud. Again, which hypervisor would I pick? And that one doesn't matter. So for that, I would deploy a Linux operating system, CentOS, Ubuntu, deploy either, uh, I, like, I personally like the Elastic Stack, but Splunk has a free edition. You can trial some of the other components. QRadar has a community edition. Pick what you want, deploy it on whatever virtual platform you're using. Whether that's Proxmox, VMware Player, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's just the fact that you're setting up an instance for that. In fact, you could even do that as containers. Um, I personally, at this point, when I deploy Elasticstack, their Docker Swarm services uh, or Kubernetes, which there is a learning curve to that. But that's a cool thing to learn too as well. So whether it's a virtual machine that you install on top traditionally or containers, um, either is going to be fine for that. Yeah. Um, can I, do I think that Hyper-V cannot compete with Proxmox or VMware? Wow. What, what do you have against Hyper-V? Come on. <laughs> no. For, for three, four years ago, all the industry said that the, the Hyper-V products are, are uh, from Microsoft are not so, so mature or they are not delivering the same um, services as VMware, VMware and yeah. another. I see a heck of a lot more vSphere than I do Hyper-V. And I prefer vSphere hands down over Hyper-V. Um, but if I were to stop and actually compare feature sets, Hyper-V's got a lot going on for it. It's just vSphere always has a few additional cool features. Uh, I think visibility is easier in vSphere, like um, getting flow data, doing very various levels of port mirroring. You can do virtual tapping and their NSX suite, if you pay for it, is really cool. Uh, but if you're just talking virtualization to virtualization, vSphere can pretty much go toe to toe with vSphere, or Hyper V can pretty much go toe to toe with vSphere. It's all the extra features that you also have to pay the extra price for that vSphere starts to beat it. 
And technically you could argue even like NSX, some of those features can be replaced with other third party services. Like um, I'm sure you've heard of this, but like um, if you do V shield that allows you to do antivirus at the hypervisor yeah. rather than at each virtual machine. Except if I'm being honest, I hate that. <laughs> I absolutely, and here's why. If you do a bake off of um, like a standard antivirus product, like McAfee Endpoint Security, Trend Micro, Semantic Endpoint versus like McAfee Move. So you have McAfee Endpoint Security versus McAfee Move. Same vendor against same vendor. Yeah. The Endpoint Security Suite will hands down crush the hypervisor because the hypervisor is bound to VMware's APIs, poof. Why do Windows boxes blue screen all the time with endpoint suites? It's because they put in their own DLLs, they write their own capabilities and they're doing things Windows isn't aware of and call it blue screen. But it's how they do their security features too. With VMware's integrations, you're bound to those APIs, meaning you can only do what they let you. It's not an apples to apples comparison. Now, does it protect you against all the system scanning at the same time? Yeah. But is that really the best risk tolerance? No. I don't know. <laughs> so I can, I can argue that one both ways. I, I think Hyper-V to me is an enterprise grade hypervisor. I just don't prefer it. Um, which is funny because every enterprise environment owns it. Where vSphere you have to pay for but you already own Hyper-V. So I think some of its preference, I think, I don't know. I think a lot of its preference, there are some cool features, but are you really paying for the license just for those cool features? Which I don't need to really in a whole lot of environment. Right. And Proxmox lets you do those cool features for free. Yeah. And you also, what I like with Proxmox is this, uh, you can mix VMs and Linux containers. so. My setup is more of an internet response lab. I have lots of VMs and I want to have shared storage from a local SSD drive. And then you can have a Linux container with a, a, a file server, a turnkey Linux file server, and then lots of VMs accessing that via SMB or NFS, whatever you want. And that works really well. And also the access to the local drive with this container will be direct with no virtualization involved, I guess. So it's going to be more optimal, optimal faster access, I guess. Uh, if set up correctly, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then of course it could take some time to get used to converting if you find VMware images that you want to run in the you have to convert them to the KVM and QE move it. When you have done that a few times, you really know how to do it then. Yes. Then it's then it's not a problem. But I think that's good experience just to be familiar with that because I mean, yeah. I've had to go from Hyper-V to VMware or vice versa. And it's really the same thing you're doing here. Yep. Yeah. Now, I have a question for you. Like the LXC containers within Proxmox, I like that. Except for most of the time when I'm doing containers, I do them as a service deployment. I haven't played with this area of Proxmox enough. Is there a way to deploy the equivalent of like a Kubernetes pod or a Docker Swarm service in Proxmox? I know I can install it after the fact under the hood, but in the web GUI, do you know if there's a way to do a service deployment with containers? I don't think so, but I haven't really looked for it either, but okay. I haven't, I don't think so actually. Okay, because I, yeah, I think you, it's e super easy to deploy a container, which I think makes it confusing because then it's like, do I want to deploy Ubuntu 2004 as an LXC container? Or do mm. I want to deploy it as a virtual machine? And what's the difference in? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so for those who aren't familiar with containers, have fun with that, because that'll probably be confusing as all get out. But uh, it's good. I, I like the approach to be able to do those LXCs, but I don't do containers that are persistent where I see Proxmark, that's kind of what the container deployments are often deployed as it's a persistent container. Yeah. Um, so I don't tend to use LXC, even though I do think it's really cool. 
But you, when you deploy containers on Proxmox, do you do it as the LXC containers because there's already uh, a, a library of templates to choose from? Yeah, I liked the, the library and the file server just was optimal for me and it, was, it felt good to have direct access to the storage. Yep. So I think that was my main reason. Okay. No, I like it. And I also think it depends on, I mean, you, you can have, maybe you want to tinker with the hypervisor. For me, I, I'm an iPhone user. It's some things I just want them to work and also the same with the hypervisor. I, I don't really want to tinker with the hypervisor. I want it to be there. I want it to do what it should. And Proxmox has been that friend for me. <laughs> Even if it's a bit odd, and you have to get used to the more Linux-based environment, but I don't find it that hard to get used to. And True. just to get there, I mean, I, I want to spend my time using the, the, the VMs, not really setting up the infrastructure and spending too much time troubleshooting. Sure. I, I, I would still, I'd still argue vSphere is probably a cleaner, easier to get up running hypervisor than Proxmox. Yeah. Um, but Proxmox, once it's up, well, all the, all the hypervisors, once they're up and running, they just work. Mm -hmm. Like, and I think that's one of the more consistent things where the type two hypervisors, they work until you install a patch or <laughs> you, mm -hmm. You upgrade them, like I'm notorious for like VMware Workstation upgrading it and then something doesn't work because I jumped versions too quickly and they're bugs. Um, you don't really have that with a hypervisor install. Now, you, have, you also have to get used to this, instead of VMware tools, you have to get used to the, uh, the, the guest agents, you, yeah. which is yeah, for Proxmox and, and messing with Windows drivers, which are optimized for KVM, QEMU. But I mean, yeah, the first time it takes a bit more time, but yeah, then you know it. Yeah. No, and see, that's that's where like, if I, if I want to say the best support as far as it working and optimally, that goes to Hyper-V. <laughs> but if it's on the hardware compatibility guide, then okay, vSphere will be fine. It'll be optimized. Um, Proxmox, I haven't had to do too much with the drivers. For the most part, it's just worked, but it is Linux and they might not have a whole bunch of support. I found better NIC support though. Cool. Like vSphere will reject a whole bunch of NICs uh, where Proxmox, I don't know if I found a NIC that it wouldn't take. It might've grabbed the wrong driver. It still would work, but then to your point, I might have to change it to get it to use the correct driver. Um, but it's kind of cool. Hmm. Now, how about hardware pass through? Has anybody done hardware pass through? So th <laughs> this, this is where you would take a virtual machine and you would expose like say a PCI card to it. Like you would actually rip it from the host and be like, here's a, uh, an NVIDIA 2080 Ti, and I'm going to pass it to this virtual machine because I wanted to use it for data science or whatever the heck use case you had. Like, um, I want to say probably five, maybe it was longer than that, years ago when TV used to be more of the cable lines, uh, I got like a capture card, put it in a PCI slot, but I passed it up to a virtual machine and ran, I think it was beyond TV or something. And it would use that capture card to record a whole bunch of channels all at once before DVR was uh, as good as it is today. Um, if you do pass through, the virtual machine basically gets it directly. There's relatively little performance penalty in doing so. And the host just doesn't touch it. Have, have you had any experience or any need for something like that? Not yet. Not yet. We will make it. <laughs> I should try. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've not done it with Proxmox. I'm pretty sure it's supported. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's supported by Hyper-V. vSphere, you literally just go on to the, you select the host and you say, um, make this PCI device or whatever it is available, which basically means host, leave it alone. And then you can go to a virtual machine, but here you go, it's yours. And you're, you're done. And so now whatever the heck that device was, whether it's a, a dedicated NIC, a graphics card, a capture card, 
it's just passed up. You can do the same thing with USB devices and stuff too. Um, I've not done it with Proxmox. I would be shocked if it didn't support it, but I honestly don't know the question on Hyper-V if that's supported. Uh, and I, the, my mind is thinking um, data science, that would probably be the number one use case. I would see that for a lab. Um, Cause even like my HPZ 620s, I bought an eBay, they came with a graphics card that's faster than the CPUs. That's kind of an edge use case. And I don't think everybody should play with uh, that but it's cool to have that support. And it's something I think everybody should be aware that that's even a possibility. The downside to those is if you have more than one box, like uh, Marcus, you, have, you said you have three. If you do host allocation, you can't migrate to another box because it's locked to the box that you, you gave it yeah. the hardware. Um, but it is what it is. <laughs> All right. Um, we also had a Amore. Are you online? Did you have any questions on this hypervisor fiasco? Florentine hit me with a bunch of questions earlier. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Wow. Awesome. Uh, to be honest, uh, oops. Hi guys. To be honest, no, I, I, I don't. Um, I've actually been following, I mean, a couple of, um, videos from a couple of other people talking about how they deploy Proxmos for like creating their own um, cyber range and virtual labs, which was why I actually joined because I'm actually thinking of doing something like that. But I haven't done the ground research to understand like how Proxmos runs on hardware and all whatnot. But it's been an insightful conversation just to be able to pick up on a few things and um, eventually um, try it out. Um, I think one thing that has actually got me more, uh, got my brain thinking is it has to be on, does it have to, do I need to deploy Proxmox on a server or can I just deploy it on like a, a, a CPU or something yeah. or my, my, my own personal laptop? Yeah. What's so vSphere, I'm sorry, Hyper-V and Proxmox, you can install it on anything. Like if you have a workstation sitting somewhere you're not using, you can just install them and they'll work. vSphere okay. has pretty strict hardware compatibility. Uh, so you're pretty much stuck with using servers. Now I'm using an HP Z620 I bought off eBay used. It's technically a desktop, but under the hood, it's server hardware and a desktop chassis. So it will work with all three. Um, Proxmox was not going to work for you on your own laptop though, because when you install Proxmox, vSphere, or really even Hyper-V kind of, it, you're, you're intending for it to be a virtual platform only. You're not running okay. like Outlook and browsing the internet. Yeah. So it's more if you have hardware laying around, but again, it could have been a workstation. It, it doesn't have to be a server. Um, if you only had a laptop or one desktop, that's where we would push you to do something like VirtualBox from Oracle. It's free. And you could still deploy your own cyber range and Active Directory and run attack tools and all that. The question for this discussion with the hypervisors is, which hypervisor is best if you're going to have dedicated lab hardware? And if you don't have dedicated lab hardware, you can still do everything we're going to talk about but you're going to do VirtualBox or VMware Workstation on top of your own machine. But, but I mean, it's, it's obvious from this conversation that having, um, having the hardware to run the hypervisor on is, I mean, profitable as compared to having a virtual environment on a personal device on a personal laptop because I would like something like ease of use of logging in from any location and having access to that lab and being able to run, I mean, multiple um, virtual machines and probably run a target and attack scenario from, from anywhere. Yeah, Correct? I, I, I think that's spot on, yeah. But I, I also yeah, know yeah. like when I started in college and I was dabbling, I couldn't afford dedicated hardware. <laughs> so I had to do it. On, and it, the thing, it would drive me nuts because like I would spin up virtual machines on my laptop at the time. But let's say I had eight virtual machines. I couldn't run all eight. I could only run two to three because that's all my hardware could support. And so I had to pick and choose. And 
start these and stop these. And it took a lot of my time because I had to keep doing that where now I have, you know, it's used hardware, but I can run, I can run probably a hundred plus virtual machines on my three Z six twenties and they cost me about 500 a piece. Uh, so I save time because I can just leave them running all the time. And then if I want to run in and run an attack simulation or something, it, they're just there and they work because nothing ever happens to them unless I'm in the environment where your laptop, you could drop it, you could break it, you could install a patch, you could, and then think of all the time investment you just went down the tube if the hard drive goes bad or, and and Proxmox, this is actually another benefit for Proxmox. They have free backup solution. So you can back up your entire virtual lab environments where with vSphere, you have to usually go for commercial third-party tools and stuff like that or buy licenses. Hyper-V, you can back up, but it's not as clean as like Proxmox is this. So. Thank you for that. I mean, because the motivation for, I mean, asking this is actually my, my desktop crashed and I'm actually looking for a more permanent solution. So it has like, I was, I was yeah, it's a, it's a CPU running like two hard disks of about one terabyte each and uh, like an AMD card in there somewhere. And the first hard disk went, it wasn't the hard disk with the operating system on it. And I mean, some weeks ago, the one with the operating system too just, just went off and I'm like, okay, I need to look for something more, more yeah. permanent. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, so, the, so eBay, I do HP Z620s, 820s, 840s. They're usually about 500 bucks. Uh, okay. And I, I do three because with Proxmark, you can take the local disks on all three and it will turn it okay. into a, like a software RAID using Ceph. Uh, and so right. now your virtual machines are effectively on all of them. So it's still fast direct access disks, whatever you put in okay. them. Um, but it's a pretty. It's so you call those HP Z20s? Uh, Z620 or Z8. I'm just going to write that down. Okay. Yeah. All right, I'll look that up. Thank you. Yep. And so I'm so I'm hearing from you, and I'm also hearing from Florentine that you both want to run attacks, but you want to launch them so that you can see them, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, so that just tells me that at some point I should have some videos to show some of that. <laughs> <laughs> The thing is, when you find something good like a detection lab from Chris Long, then there is normally not really support for things, odd things like Proxmox. Then it's easier if you have something more. Yeah. Well, so I'm, I'm actually glad you brought that up. So, Detection Lab is one of the most well put together auto deployments for detection. And yet, I often will tell students, check it out, but then don't use it. Ooh. And let me caveat that. The problem I have with the project is that it's so cool, but it's automated. And so the problem is if you have a lab environment and you run the detection lab installer, like you get Windows event collection with systems and Splunk and all these things set up, but you don't know how to do it. And it kind of defeats the purpose. Like unless you truly just want to do the log collection and analysis, and you don't want it, you like, you know, iPhone user, like you said, right? I just want it to be there and work. That's totally fine. Cause you're still learning how to do, be really good at, at, at like security analysis. But I struggle because I want to know how all those components that got the log to my screen, I want to know how those worked. So my mission in the lab is if I'm going to do Splunk, I need to manually install Splunk. In fact, it might even be to the point where I eventually want to automate that, but I'm now learning how to automate it so that I can stand it up and tear it down over and over and over. Then I'll learn Windows event collectors and forwarding and group policy and Active Directory. And and so I'm hesitant for automated lab deployments because I think it robs us of a lot of the learning process. If Yeah, if you're ever going to need to know that, if you never do, then go for it. But I feel like most of us would benefit from that. So, okay. at the same time, you have to feed the kids so the animals long before you have finished setting up these labs. So oh, <laughs> sometimes I, you just need to get it done. But <laughs> I, I agree with that. I agree with that. And to each your own. And I think we all hopefully understand our, our destinies. 
Like mm. if you're only going to be in an analyst role, there's nothing wrong with doing an auto deploy. And cause now during interviews and stuff, you can answer those questions of, well, I have this log and this log and here's what I'm looking for. I'm just saying a lot of the blue team, I think are generalists, meaning we dabble in a little of everything. And so we would benefit from learning each of those aspects, time permitting and kids not screaming. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So does everybody feel we got a good handle then on the hypervisor discussion? When and where maybe we would do vSphere versus Hyper-V versus Proxmox. I think all of that is valuable, but... I have a question for you. Yep. Uh, let's say, you know, like, you have the series of videos about, um, you know, on YouTube, the channel, the big lab and whatever. So let's say someone, I don't know, maybe I have some students, they, they might have, like, 32 gigabytes machine, dedicated machine, so I say maybe they should go with Prodmos and don't know the other options around. Yeah, so low hardware, like 32 gig of RAM, which, which yeah. would be the best hypervisor? Uh, I, I would actually say of the three, Proxmark or vSphere would be fine. Okay. In, in the example you just gave me, I would actually say vSphere might actually be preferred. Okay, and, right. and the reason I'm saying this, yeah, is vSphere takes a very minimum amount of RAM Okay. And it's not very well documented, but there's this thing called memory compression. Mm -hmm. And so I used to have a, like an Intel NUC and I would run 64 gig worth of virtual machines, RAM, but the NUC only had 32 gig of physical RAM. Okay. But with vSphere, I could actually tell it to go past the limit and start compressing RAM. And it would chew 10% of my CPU up but now I could deploy a whole bunch of additional virtual machines because of its memory compression capabilities, plus transparent memory paging, plus memory ballooning. And I would say of the three, vSphere does the best at memory control. Okay. Proxmark second place, Hyper-V third, because you have the big fat windows installed and it's chewing up more RAM. So, so there's, oh, yeah. Yeah, because it's important, you know, like we discussed about solution, but let's say someone has like, Less than 30, uh, 64 gig of RAM, so it's better to go if possible with uh, Yeah, okay. I, I think if low RAM, vSphere is probably a better fit. Okay. Um, 32, gig, 32 gig and up though, I'd still say Proxmox and really even Hyper-V are fine. But if you're trying to deploy the most memory hungry VMs you can, vSphere probably is going to be a better, better fit and look at memory compression because it's pretty, it's a very easy setting under advanced settings to tune. Okay. And then okay. off to the races you go. Okay, cool. Yeah. And also like another question, let's say, <clears throat> is it a must to have a SSD or NVMe for the VMs? Oh, okay. Is it a must? That's, that's a very subjective question. Okay. <laughs> like, I'll put it in perspective, though. If you're doing a SATA hard drive, 7,200 RPM, yes. you probably can only run four virtual machines with any decent performance. And that might even be a stretch. Okay. So if, if you're going to have, like on a 32 gig RAM box, you could probably run 20 to 40 virtual machines, depending on how you're sizing them. There's no way that's going to work on a SATA hard drive at all. Like if you told it to start four Windows boxes on one SATA drive, yes. okay. it'll take 15 minutes for them to turn on. Okay. But if I do an SSD and I say 20 turn on, it, it might still take two minutes, but on SATA, it could have crashed your operating system. It just wouldn't keep up. So if, okay. if you're planning on doing many VMs, especially like 10 plus, I would say SSD is a requirement. It doesn't have to be NVMe. It could be general purpose SSD. Um, yeah. If you're gonna run 50 plus, then on one box, then you might want NVMe or PCI maybe. But if you're doing 50 plus, usually you have more than one box. And then again, general purpose SSD is fine because you're spreading it out. Yeah, because it's important. Also, some people, they have the, you know, like you just said, you know, and many like students and they don't have the means to to go crazy you know like 
you know. So for them, maybe they know the limitation. Okay, I have to use this virtualization. I have this type of hardware. How many VMs? Okay, so well, and, and so for students, especially like nowadays, yeah, the laptops yeah. that they have that they bring into class, they have SSDs or NVMEs in them. And so they would probably be better not doing a hypervisor and instead doing Oracle VirtualBox or mm -hmm. VMware Workstation. Because yeah. then the other thing from them, like even if they had a smaller hard drive, you can do what's called link clones, in which mm -hmm. case it doesn't, like if I had a 10 gig VM and I create a link clone, I'm still only using 10 gig in total between the two. And if I had five more, I'm still only using 10 gig until I write new entries on these. So yeah. you can have a lot of VMs on these new laptops because nowadays most laptops are having SSD anyway. So, yeah. But hyper -V, a hypervisor is really nice, but we all can't afford that depending on where we're at in life. Yeah. Yep. Okay, cool. All Thanks. right. Any, anybody else have any other questions? Hypervisor or similar? I don't care. <laughs> no, yeah, it made me curious about uh, Proxmox. I tried it like few years ago. I had a friend; he was very keen to it, and I had a dedicated server. I didn't like it so much, so I put a VMware on it. But now maybe I'm going to try give it another try. Yeah, Proxmox has gone a long way, and it just keeps getting better and better. Um, the installation process is much much easier now. So yeah, I mean, uh, I'd give it a shot. Yeah, I mean, I'm talking about six years ago or more. So yeah. maybe it wasn't so, so much of that. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Florentine, did you, you have something you're saying? No, no, I got, I got all the answer I need from, okay. from you and I thank you. Okay, well, anybody, if you have questions, feel free to email me or message me on um, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, whatever the usual suspects are. And uh, we'll keep trying to go down this because I'm, I'm hoping we can get some of the best home lab builds out there we can.